Okay, let's get rocking and rolling. I wanted to start today's training with a tip around the federal market. Sometimes people uh, don't understand the federal market and we, we think that there's, uh, that there's more to the people we meet than is reality. And, and the federal buyer, whether it's a small business professional or contracting officer or somebody in a program office, they don't know everything about that agency, right? If it's a tiny agency that has 200 people, sure. But if it's the Navy, as an example, they don't know even a fraction of the Navy and what goes on. I used this example with somebody yesterday to explain my Army career and how I progressively learned so much more about what the Army did. If you don't know this, I started my Army career as a Ranger, so an Airborne Ranger, um, and, and uh, the lowest unit I got into was a squad. Actually, I was a machine gunner, so I was even a, a smaller team, if you will. But it was a squad, and the squad's 10 people, and it's part of a, a company of, um, or a, a platoon of 40 people, basically, and a, um, and a company, right? And in the Rangers, we had uh, the squad, and I learned about the squad, and I learned about the, uh, the battalion is where I was at, 2nd second, second 75th. And so I learned about that when I first got in the Army. And then I um, moved on to work for the garrison commander. And so a garrison commander is basically a full bird colonel who's in charge of making sure the military base runs as it should. So all the tenant units, all the different military units can do their job. So the garrison commander is in charge of the garrison. Uh, they're not necessarily deploying to war. They're taking care of the base. And then um, from there, I got uh, moved on to work for the Corps commander. So the uh, I Corps commander was the three-star general on Fort Lewis, Washington, where I was at. And now I'm seeing it in a whole different world. I'm seeing the Army um, from a perspective of we deployed to Japan and we almost brought more soldiers than they had in the entire country when America deploys for exercises over there. So I saw it. And I'm like, wow, I know so much more. But then I went from there to the Pentagon and I worked for the Secretary of the Army. And in the Secretary of the Army, one of the particular things that just really struck me uh, as I was supporting the Under Secretary of the Army was how we were dealing with recruitment across uh, the uh, the country, right? It's a sales problem that the, the military was having. Um, we were also turning over the Panama Canal. And so my point here in this tip, and as it relates to today's training about being an expert is don't try to be an expert at everything. Even somebody in the Navy can't possibly know everything about the Navy. You can sit there and begin to learn more about that. Um, what federal agencies need is for you to be an expert at what you're an expert at. They need your support to accomplish the missions today, tomorrow, and well into the future. I posted a document this morning on LinkedIn. If you're following me, you should have got a notification. And this is an Air Force documentation or document that describes the evolution from the Cold War after World War II, the evolution from there into um, into today and in this changing environment that we keep going through. In particular, is the Air Force talking about this is what we need from ourselves and this is what we need from industry to support us. But if I stay with the Air Force for one second, they're an expert at their own mission. They are not an expert at what I do. They're not necessarily an expert at what your company offers, right? There's. Uh, I was talking yesterday with um, Matt and you can go watch that training, but he was talking a lot about the innovation the federal government needs and the innovative products come in. You are the innovative side of the, the equation, right? The government has to accomplish a mission and they're very good at that. And they're looking for people like you, companies like yours to be the subject matter expert and to serve as their trusted advisor, somebody they can count on as they're looking at immediate needs and long range, like their 10, 20, 30 year long range plans, right? So depending on where you're at, you can address more and more of that. So that's what we're gonna talk about today is really diving into um, how can you be the SME, the subject matter expert that federal buyers need? And the way I'm gonna break today's training down is first I just wanna talk about why it's important, give you some reasons around that to understand why it's important to uh, be able to position your company and yourself as a SME. The second thing is um, how you can define that subject matter expertise. And so I wanna walk through a couple of tips there and wrap up with how do you demonstrate or put the word out that you're a subject matter expert? It's one thing to put you know, Neil McDonald, SharePoint SME or federal uh, sales SME, Right? It's another to demonstrate it. And so I demonstrated that I was a SharePoint expert and our company was a SharePoint expert in my last company, right? I demonstrated this through our past performance and through the content that I constantly put out. In fact, what you see me doing today, if you've been with me for a while, this training I do, I learned how to do at my last company, just promoting SharePoint. And you can do that same thing. So I wanna give you some ideas on how to do that. 
If you don't know who I am, my name is Neil McDonald. I am the president of the GovCon Chamber of Commerce and co-founder of GovCon in a Box. I wanna welcome you to my federal sales training where I provide tips for success in the federal market. I also provide you an opportunity to network others with others in the federal market, right? This is your community, it's our community and we just keep making it stronger each time you chat and say hello with somebody else. Um, so make sure you engage with people, make sure you invite your friends. If you like somebody, tell them that we have the training and, and we'd love to have them join us. If you haven't done so, uh, subscribe to the Government Contracting Success Newsletter. This is our newsletter on all things related to government contracting sales. And so sometimes it's teaching you about the agency, sometimes it's teaching you about methodologies, methodologies on sale, sales um, so that you can have success, right? Um, so join that, subscribe to that. And then lastly, I wanted to mention on this slide is tomorrow I've got a, a, a great friend who's coming in who I've never met. <laughs> it's like, this is how a network works and a community works. I have known Steve Koprens for years and years and he's known of me for years. Um, but this will be the first time we've talked and we're gonna have a fireside chat about uh, things small businesses should be concerned about from a legal perspective. He's not giving any legal advice, but I'm going to uh, be able to chat with him about tips. And I'm not looking for just this slide, this slide, this slide. Steve has got some of the best content out there that makes us think about our business, protecting it and understanding. Um, and so I just wanted to bring him in and share some tips. Make sure you register for that on Thursday. Okay. Uh, and congratulations to the newest members of the 100 Club. These companies, Airborne uh, Outfitters and AET Federal, I'm super excited to have them in. I know the journey that uh, in particular Airborne Outfitter went through. Kathy really pushed through on this. But what they did was they took their visibility score from somewhere less than 100 to 100. Some people, like a couple of the companies in the last couple of days, they have gone from 24 to 100. And you can have a score of zero to 100, right? And what we do is provide guidance on govconinabox.com for free very detailed guidance on how you can go increase your visibility to federal buyers. So take a minute to do it. But one thing I just really want to point out, 44 companies have this score of 100, right? They're, they're in the 100 club. The reason that is so staggering is that there's 360,000 small businesses currently registered to sell to the federal government. These are current active businesses. And, um, and only four of them, 44 of them have 100 scores. So come join us. All you have to do is check out GovCon in a box. It's free. It's it's uh, um, all just helping you fix your profile on SAM and DSPS. Okay, so let's dive into the meat of today's training, beginning with why is it important to be a subject matter expert? Um, if you believe in the topic and you're excited to talk about it, do me a favor, throw into the chat SMEs rock or SME rock. Um, oh, a SME is, it stands for subject matter expert, right? And the idea is a SME is somebody who is, known for one thing, uh, they're, they're an expert at this particular area. And so for me at my last company, it was Microsoft SharePoint. That was tight enough that that was our expertise. And so our company's expertise was around that. My personal expertise, uh, subject matter expertise, has really always been around sales. I've been doing sales for 30 years in all different variations of it. And I'm a student of sales. And so I've really taken the time to do that. Um, and so you'll hear me talk about how I've done that, but what's your subject matter expertise area, right? What are you a subject matter expert in or your company? And it can't be this long paragraph, right? It's, uh, it's this one thing, SharePoint for me or sales for me. What is that one thing? Because when you know uh, what your SME is or your expertise is, then you can start letting people know. And when, uh, when you have a SME, a, when you are a SME, you begin to get known for that. People know of you and they'll tell others, et cetera, right? And so that's really important to get known for that one thing. We call this sometimes pigeonholing or typecast. If you think about an actor, uh, an actor sometimes doesn't want to get typecast as only the comedian. It's like, no, I can do drama work or action or whatever. Um, and they're afraid to be typecast because then the only movies they get invited to participate on are ones that are comedies, for example. Uh, for us in our world in the federal market, we really do want to be known for one thing. We want to be typecast because the way sales works is once you're uh, known for one thing, you get brought in for that one thing. And then you can talk about other things later as you uh, really build your experience within that customer. Um, but getting known for one thing is really a vital reason or a valuable reason for being a SME. Uh, the second one is that people want to believe in you, right? And so we say conviction closes the sale. 
if you think about this, right? If they, if you have so much conviction in what you're talking about, you're closing the deal. They're believing you. They, uh, they, we call this sometimes um, shifting authority. They just look to you as that expert, and and they think to themselves, well, I should listen to this person, right? I feel their conviction. I feel how they're talking about this is the right approach. I'll give you a quick example. My last company, again, we did SharePoint solutions and we did huge solutions. And one of the ways that I was able to demonstrate how good we were was I talked about migrating from this platform to this platform um, in a way that would focus on user adoption. And I would talk about user adoption is the most important thing. And we techies can do things a little different in our approach to ensure that the users are happy with whatever we're doing. And so I had so much conviction upon it that they changed the entire requirements for the uh, piece of work we were going after. So everybody had to talk about what they do to adoption and they didn't do that really well. But the people I'm talking to, they want to believe in what you're selling. Um, sometimes in proposals, I talk about, you wanna be compelling and, con uh, and convincing, right? And so that conviction, you're convincing them through your conviction. Uh, I believe so much in what I'm talking about. And I, and I back it up with data and evidence. It's not just blind belief. Um, this third bullet I have in the middle, people buy from those they know, like, and trust. And it's hard to really trust you. And this is not, are you going to steal from me trust, right? This is, do I trust that you can do the job in our mission? I trust that you're a good, honest person. <laughs> That's not what I'm talking about. Do they know, like, and trust you means um, their trust in your ability to solve the problem address the mission that they have. And so when you're a subject matter expert, it makes it so much easier for them to um, really to know and like you, but also most importantly, trust you. They can see what you talk about. They can see it makes sense. It, they might test it out a couple of times by doing a second opinion somewhere, but then they come back and they're like, no, this person's advice is spot on. What these people talk about is spot on. Um, it helps me have trust in them. When you have that trust, right? When people know, like, and trust you because of your subject matter expertise, they're gonna invite you in to more meetings. You're gonna get uh, an industry partner refer you to somebody else and they're gonna say, hey, I heard from Tim Kelly, he told me to call you. You're an expert at this area, right? And so you're gonna get invited into teaming uh, uh, arrangements. You're gonna get invited by the federal government to come in and talk about what you do. Literally this morning, I was talking to a company that I hope I get to work with, but they're a SharePoint company as well. And they were talking about um, the way they were able to get recognized by a DOD customer is that DO, that customer, that program manager, saw that they were an expert and said, can you come in and talk with us? That doesn't happen when you don't have an area of expertise. It happens, though, when you are an expert at a particular topic. During market research, the federal government wants to hear from you. They want to have conversations, right? I get it. Sometimes we send RFI responses and we don't hear back from the contracting officer. That's not really market research. That's just uh, that's just bothering us. <laughs> that's another thing. But when you really have a program office trying to do market research and find out what does industry think about the direction we're going, the problems we have or the goals we have, what does industry uh, think? They want to get you in. They're having conversations with you and your website. When you're a subject matter expert and they can see this, and we'll talk about that in the last slide, then you're going to get invited to more of these conversations because they know you're not just going to come in there and try to sell, 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 but you're going to come in there and help them think through what they're doing. Are we doing the right way? Okay, let's get going. And that may or may not be um, uh, like a direct word to you, but it sure is to your advantage because now you get to ask them questions as well. And the last thing, just going with that people buy from those they know, like, and trust, when you get trusted, then the next step is you're elevated up into a trusted advisor. When they start coming back to you again and again for your expertise, you are their trusted advisor. You don't need a formal piece of paper, a handshake agreement. You can tell that you're the trusted advisor because they come back over and over to you. Okay, so let's talk about how to define that expertise. So um, I actually wanna jump if I can to the third bullet where I say you can't be a cloud SME because I think this gives an example. And it's because I saw this uh, in some other conversation I had very recently, where I saw somebody trying to say they, they do all things cloud. And if you don't know about the cloud, right? I mean, you probably do a little bit, but the cloud, there's uh, Microsoft cloud, there's Amazon or AWS cloud, 
right? There's Oracle Cloud, there's Google Cloud. And so they were saying they're good on all of them. I'm like, how can you be good on all of them? <laughs> like, not just one, pick one of them. But then inside of each cloud, let's say you pick Microsoft's cloud, you can't say inside of there, I'm an expert on everything in the cloud because the cloud basically contains everything. And so you're, you want to focus it down even tighter, um, down into sitting there saying, you know, I stand up environments in a cloud, that's our expertise. Um, or we do software development in the cloud, that's another different uh, expertise. There's a whole different expertise around the administration of the cloud. And so uh, what I wanna encourage you is, when you think about coming back to that first bullet, when you think about what your subject matter expertise is, what you wanna be known as a SME for, make sure it's around a niched down area that you can clearly communicate, right? We call it a clear focused offer. This is what we do. This is what I'm an expert at. If you can niche it down, then you start being able to differentiate yourself, but you also start being able to develop um, the foundation for becoming a SME or more importantly, just demonstrating that you are a SME in that area. Um, another bullet I had here is you really must have been paid for this. Uh, you know, for the most part in our space, in the federal market, government contractors, if you want to be known as a subject matter expert, then you better have been paid for it, right? And, and in my opinion, generally, you better have been doing it as well. And so, for example, I was a subject matter expert in SharePoint in my last company. I've been paid for that. I've been paid many times for that, but I also physically did that numerous times. Uh, I tell a story often about how the White House had this huge thing and I was there 24 seven or 24 hours over a course of seven days um, with uh, the White House uh, CIO and I, the whole team in there as they had this major issue. I've physically been in there and because I had the highest clearance, I was able to go in there and, and do a lot of this. And so that made me be able to demonstrate that I'm a SME. You don't need that level of expertise to be in there because there's a level between experience and, and study. I'm, I'm fully okay with that. Um, but you want to make sure that you've been paid for this, that you can demonstrate that, look, I'm not just academically a subject matter expert, but I've implemented this, right? I teach sales all the time, federal government contracting. I am an expert. I'm not an expert in every single thing in federal government contracting, but I am an expert in sales because sales is something I've been doing forever. And I've been paid for this. I've been paid for it just through the contracts I've won and I've been paid through consulting. So what have you been paid for that you feel like you're a subject matter expert at? Think about that for a second. If you're comfortable, put it in the chat. I'd love to come back later and, and look at it, maybe learn more about your company, but you need to sit there and um, be an expert and understand that niche down. The other thing that goes down, uh, goes with you niching down um, around all the possibilities down to one core focused offer is, or clear focused offer is you need to understand the person you're selling to or the company you're selling to, the agency you're selling to. You need to understand their situation. You can't just understand a solution. We call that a solution looking for a problem. But worse than this is if you don't even understand the problem, then you're not an expert. And, and I'm not saying you, right? But let's just say all of us, right? We're not an expert if we don't fully understand the problem, our customer, if we don't understand their pain points and the challenges that they're facing that our area of expertise can address, then how does that make us an expert? It just makes us an expert on knowing the features and benefits of our product or our service, but it doesn't uh, make us an expert on understanding how can it be implemented? to the advantage of the customers that we're trying to support. And so we need to understand those pain points and we also need to understand their goals. What are they trying to accomplish? Not just in the short term, but what would our services and products help them then accomplish, right? When you fully understand their situation and you fully understand your own offering, your area of expertise, now you're truly a subject matter expert. Um, and so you really wanna focus on that. Okay, so let's talk about uh, ways you can demonstrate to buyers that you're a SME. And I just gave you a couple here that I'm going to talk about and give you examples. Um, I'm happy to share a bigger list. In fact, I've done training on this before where I, I've taught a lot of different ways. I think 10 and 20 uh, bullet lists of different ways you can let customers know you exist and let them know your company's area of expertise, right? Um, the first thing before I talk about these, it's really important to understand that information is now free. If, if you've not realized this yet, Stop selling information. Stop hoarding information. That was okay yesterday. It's not okay today and tomorrow because now uh, people know that information is free. We expect it to kind of be free, right? Who would 
buy what I sell. Like, I mean, I teach this every single day. Why would you pay for this? When you got a guy like me, give it away for free. And there's like five more people just like me giving it away the information for free. Uh, they share tips on how you can have success. Well, it's the same thing with you, right? Think about your area of expertise and give without expectation. So give freely of the information since it is freely available. And then the second thing is give without expectation. Don't give the information in the hope somebody's going to come to you. I don't bring you into these trainings and go, oh, I hope I get a sale out of it. More often than not, I forget to tell you I even work with people because I, I'm so focused on what I'm teaching. And I want you to do that same thing. Don't have any expectation for what you uh, share out there and what you demonstrate. And here's a couple of ideas. Um, the first one is my all-time favorite, right? It's, it's uh, sharing content on LinkedIn. Uh, and you could duplicate this onto your website, but share it on LinkedIn. Federal buyers are on LinkedIn. I just watched the, uh, a person who's the head, uh, number two, but kind of the head of a uh, multi-billion dollar program office within the federal government, came in and was engaging with my content yesterday. Literally the same thing today with some of the Air Force stuff I was talking about. Uh, I, I, I target a different audience, so don't do that. But you want to share your area of expertise, your information out on LinkedIn. And I can give you a tip on that in a minute on how. But you want to share that on LinkedIn because federal buyers and potential teammates are here. Small business professionals are here and SBA personnel are here. The more you're able to share related to what you are an expert at, the more you will begin to be visible to the people who would want to find somebody like you. Or you'd be visible to me where I go, oh, they're the uh, ABC uh, company, right? They're, I mean, that, that's the court like SharePoint company. They're a SharePoint company. You want somebody like me to remember you that way. It's like, oh, that's what they do, right? If I think about Sea uh, Hill, I think about executive recruiting and full life cycle or full cycle employment or recruiting, right? I, I begin to think of that and I want to know other companies just like that. Well, I do that when you share content out on LinkedIn because it comes up in a feed in front of me. And it, you don't have to start big. You can start really small, uh, simple tips, et cetera. The next one staying on LinkedIn is you can engage on LinkedIn. And this is a big one. I do this. Uh, I was I was going to share with you, but it's too much. Uh, it's too much hassle. Uh, but I did a um, I do this thing where I go in on other posts and I engage with it and I try to find something I can contribute to. Right. Not hijack their posts, not go in and sell me. But I go in and I sit there and say, oh, yeah, I like that. And another thing I was thinking is I wonder if this can apply with this or something. But I'm sticking within the whole idea. No one knows what I'm doing. They're looking at that going, yeah, that makes that piece of content more valuable. And so I engage on LinkedIn that way. I engaged on a post. Uh, it, was, it was last week, maybe I think it was last week. And uh, but it has 96 engagements on my engagement. So I increased the engagement for the person who posted, the subject matter expert who posted the content, I increased their engagement by bringing my audience to them. And then I also uh, got 96 likes and a bunch of them came from people I didn't know, but they see me a little incremental, just one little uh, touch point of, oh, this guy knows what he's talking about. Maybe they click on my profile and look at me. Maybe they just wait and they see another thing from me and another thing and they begin to go, you know what? I kind of like what this guy's saying. Let me go look at his profile, his LinkedIn profile or his website. Um, and that is the same thing I want for you. When you post content, when you engage on other people's content, you will begin to demonstrate you're an expert. One thing to remember is make sure, and, and, and this is hard for people, so, and I get it, make sure you're only posting your area of expertise. I sometimes see people trying to post my type of content or completely unrelated content to what they do. Uh, social media needs to begin to figure out what you're good at. If they can't figure it out, they don't really share your content out to many people because they're like, well, I don't know what you do. But if they see you talking about elevators and then elevators and then elevators, they're like, well, I'm sharing that out to anybody who looks at elevators or I'm pushing it out more because this looks like a subject matter expert in elevators because they write about elevators. They engage in content. The LinkedIn algorithm, the tools, the, the brain behind LinkedIn, it begins to learn your patterns and don't let it learn a pattern that isn't going to let people know what you're good at, right? Um, respond to RFIs is a huge one for me. It's a way you can demonstrate your own expertise. I used to do this all the time. And, um, and listen to me, there is a full life cycle, sales life cycle, but the RFIs are one part of it. And you want to engage in the life cycle in as many spots. And so the RFI is a fantastic spot. And here's why. 
often people can't get into the program office to be able to talk to anybody. So they can't shift left of market research because they don't know anybody. Literally, I was just talking to a person this morning who they're doing pretty well in, in a DOD, but they can't get traction anywhere and they because they can't get in the door. Well, in RFI, one of the things I really like about it is if you write to your subject matter expertise, your core competency, then when you write that RFI response, for the most part, it is going to be reviewed by the program office, right? Forget about anybody else for a second. It's going to go in and into the program office and they're going to um, be asked, hey, what do you think? Do you like this? Do you care? Do you want to follow up? And I don't care whether they follow up or not. You have just demonstrated to them that you're an expert in SharePoint and these are the things they should be considering. And if you write RFIs for the win, meaning you're trying to win a future uh, contract or win that relationship, then you've got on their radar. That's all an RFI needs to do is to get on the radar, right? And don't, uh, don't focus on RFIs that require you to spend days writing them. You should be good at writing one solid RFI for your core competency. If you can't get that out in a single day, then you're writing farther outside your core competency. And I recommend you niche in. Okay, la uh, second to last one is uh, host webinars like I'm doing right here. You can do them live like I do, or you can do them recorded um, and then post them up. But this is a great way to share people. Hey, here's five, 10 slides. Let me talk to you about uh, how to install an elevator. Let me talk to you about how to migrate SharePoint uh, from one platform to the other. But host webinars, you have all this expertise inside of you and inside of your company. Make sure you're making it easy for your buyers and your potential teammates to hear about that and learn about you. The last thing is something you can do is just begin to let yourself be uh, known to be available to be on a panel. So uh, I have somebody I'm bringing on Friday, Ziad. He's going to talk about FedRAMP. The reason I'm bringing him on is because he was at another panel. I was like, oh, that's cool. I can bring him over here because I'd love to ask him questions. So consider volunteering your expertise on a panel. Local Chamber of Commerce, um, sometimes they're looking for GovCon experts to come in. Here's what I want you to remember from today's training. People don't buy, people buy from those they know, like, and trust, right? So make sure you're doing the things that help them know you and begin to like you. And then in particular, trust you. And the way that can happen is you niche down to one area of expertise, be that subject matter expert that they're looking for. And the, the tip I want to give you, walk away activity, I want you to go do is really consider just writing a top five list for LinkedIn that you can post on LinkedIn right now in the afternoon and tag me. If you do it today, I will engage with it, right? But a top five list where you say something like, you know, the top five things uh, the construction people should think about, or maybe the top five elevator manufacturers, which one am I missing? You don't have to overthink it. You literally can go into my profile, look down at my post, find one you like, and kind of duplicate the framework for your area of expertise. Uh, don't forget to subscribe to the newsletter, register for tomorrow's training with Steve Coprince. I'm really excited about that. If you're interested in working with me and my team, we do have a BD Accelerator workshop. It's for companies doing 2 million plus, there is an investment. Uh, and so we want to make sure you're going to have success. Just put workshop in the chat. And we'll get back to you. As you go through your day, just remember government contracting. It is not a secret. It's just a process. I will see you in the next training.